trees, trees uh, which stands for Talks on Renewables, Empowering Earth and Sustainability, brought to you by GCOE ACE. World Environment Day 2022 is the biggest international day for the environment, led by the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, and held annually since 1973. It has grown to be the largest global platform for environmental outreach. It is celebrated by millions of people across the world. World Environment Day 2022 is hosted by Sweden and only one earth is the campaign slogan uh, for the focus on living sustainably, sustainably in harmony with nature. You can visit https www.worldenvironmentday.global. Now it is my immense pleasure to introduce the guest speaker today before inviting him to begin the talk titled Biodiversity for Sustaining the Earth's Ecosystem. Dr. Daniels is a graduate and postgraduate in agriculture and a PhD in ecology. After obtaining a PhD in ecology from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore in 1990, he has worked in India, Panama and Bangladesh on various aspects of tropical ecology. His professional experience covers aspects of plant and vertebrate ecology and conservation science primarily in the Western Ghats and later across terrestrial and marine ecosystems throughout India and abroad. As a tropical ecologist, Dr. Daniels has traveled to at least 11 countries on various assignments, including those of UNAP, uh, NAM and IUCN. He has taught in many universities throughout the country and abroad. He has guided doctoral and postgraduate students on various topics in the field of biology. He advised an e the ecological management of the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, and Indian Institute of Technology, Mandi. He has served as an ecological advisor to the Karunia University in Coimbatore. Dr. Daniel has had the experience of drafting the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan for Bangladesh. He was an expert consultant in drafting guidelines for preparing biodiversity action plans for South Asian countries based in Colombo. He served as an expert consultant to the National Biodiversity Authority in drafting the fifth National Biodiversity Action Plan. He was a member of the Tamil Nadu State Wildlife Board and a life member of the Indian Society of Ecological Economics. He is an elected fellow of the International Ornithologist Union. Dr. Daniels has authored 13 books, over 50 peer-reviewed scientific papers, and more than 100 popular articles and chapters in books. I would also like to mention that the Care Earth Trust, who he is a co-founder, had submitted the detailed report of the ecological management plan of the permanent campus of the Indian Institute of Technology, Dharwad. A special thanks to Dr. Jayashri Venkateshan, Dr. Yan Krishna Kumar, Dr. Avantika, and Mr. Yan Muthu Karthik, and other team members of the Care Trust who helped us to understand the landscape and the accurate survey of the campus. This report is available with the Office of the Dean, uh, IPS, Professor Nagesh Ayer. I now invite Dr. Daniels to begin his talk and also please share the screen. We would also like to inform the audience that you may post your questions in the question answer box. Uh, Dr. Daniels? Uh, yes. Thank you, Dr. Patil, for your kind invitation for me to join this uh, program. It's a pleasure for me to be part of this program. And I also thank you for introducing me to the audience. I will now start uh, sharing the slides. Yes, can you see my slide? Yes, sir. Yes, we can. Okay, okay. So I, I will start. Uh, I will be talking to you today about biodiversity for sustaining the Earth's ecosystems. So I will be taking you over about 40 or 42 slides to explain what I have in mind. 
Now, first we will start by understanding some of the terms that I will be using throughout my talk because these are terms which are common in ecological literature, but uh, not many people would be familiar with this. So I thought I will start by explaining to you some of the terms that I would be using during my talk. The first term is biodiversity. So biodiversity means the visible and invisible variations in life. By this, I mean whatever living things that we see around us, whatever we do not see like microorganisms, diseases, and you know, you know, infectious, infection causing viruses and bacteria, and the genetic variations that you see in many of these organisms, which are not visible to the naked eye, all these variations put together is what we call biodiversity. So in a simple, term, it can be said that uh, all the variations in life that we see around us, which includes the visible forms as well as the invisible forms such as bacteria, viruses, and so on. I hope this is clear to you. Now, the word biologic, bi biodiversity has been derived from two words, biological, biological plus diversity. This was, it was earlier known as biological diversity. Later on, it was condensed to be known as biodiversity. Now I will introduce to you another term, species. Now, species is a biological unit commonly used to assess biodiversity. You know, we assess biodiversity, how many different species are there in Earth and so on. This I will be talking to you in more detail later. Uh, so species is a common unit that we use for assessing biodiversity. Biologists have estimated that there are 8 to 13 million species on Earth. You know, total number of species ranges between 8 and 13 million, which is a fairly large number to be present on Earth. Now, these are all species, different kinds of species. You could see birds and mammals, reptiles, and so on, plants. All these are species. Each one is a different species. You know, human being is a species, dog is a species cattle, buffalo, each one is a different species. So like that, we have 8 to 13 million species on Earth. Now we will also see another term called ecosystems, because this is what the central theme of my talk today is. So I will introduce you to the, the word ecosystems. So ecosystems are also biological units, but they are characterized by species and their interactions. So we first saw species, now we see ecosystems. Ecosystems are characterized by different species and their interactions. So the interactions are between species. One species interacts with another species. We will see these interactions in more detail later. Interaction between species and Interaction between species and their environment, how species interact with the soil, how species interact with rainfall, how species interact with the weather, how they interact with the atmosphere and so on. So all these interactions put together characterize a ecosystem. So ecosystem, unlike unit, unlike species, is a combination of species and characterized by the interactions between them. Now, this word sustainable, because we are talking about sustainable earth and so on, what does that mean? So sustainable basically means utilizing resources without exhausting them. That is the simplest meaning of sustainable, utilizing resources without exhausting them. Now, this word sustainable development is development without depleting natural resources and biodiversity. So we do development, but at the same time, we are careful not to deplete natural resources and biodiversity, natural resources like water, soil, etc. Now, sustainable ecosystems, ecosystems that do not lose their original character and processes. So ecosystems need to be intact if we have to sustain our earth, and they do not lose their original character and processes. Now, this next term that you, I would like to introduce to you is ecosystem resilience. This is the inherent ability of an ecosystem to recover after a shock or a disturbance. So every ecosystem remains in a condition. Suddenly, there is a shock. This shock would be due to a climate change, due to, due to an earthquake, due to fire, due to some natural phenomenon. 
but it could also be due to disturbance caused by human beings. But after this disturbance, the ecosystem is able to come back to its original self. That ability to come back is what we call ecosystem resilience. This is another important term that you need to understand. Now, ecological restoration is bringing back a degraded ecosystem to its original or near original condition. So you have degraded ecosystems and they should be brought back to the original or near original condition that is called ecological restoration. This picture shows a restoration effort in uh, South India of mangroves. So see how in 2008 till you know 2011, the ecosystem has been restored. So this is what we mean by restoration. Now, ecosystem processes, there are four processes which are called ecosystem processes, which are very important in sustaining the earth. One is the water cycle. The second is the nutrient cycle. The third is the energy cycle. The fourth is succession. So on the right hand corner, you could see water cycle. Water cycle is basically how water travels between the atmosphere and the earth and below the ground and then comes back to the atmosphere. That whole process is called the water cycle which is very important. And in amongst the living organisms, the trees particularly play a very important role in maintaining the water cycle. Similarly, we have nutrient cycle. This is how nutrients from the soil get into the living organisms and some of them, they go to the atmosphere and so on. So there is a complete cycle of nutrients and animals and plants play a very important role in the nutrient cycle of the earth. Now, energy cycle, many of you would have studied in your school, you know, you would have seen these ecological food pyramids in school, you know, books would show you pyramids of food, you know, food, food cycle. So the, the energy flows from one organism to another in the form of, you know, food. When they consume the food, the energy travels between one orga organism to other. So that is what is shown as an ecological pyramid. So this is concerning the food. Now succession is what comes after a particular reef. You have a particular ecosystem. Now that ecosystem gives way to another ecosystem. Now that is called succession. The change that takes place in an ecosystem is called succession. Two kinds of succession are identified. One is primary succession, which is natural. Naturally, one ecosystem gives way, way to another ecosystem over a period of time due to natural processes. But secondary succession is something which is caused by human beings. Now, there is a forest and then human beings destroy the forest. Later on, something else grows in its place that is called a secondary succession. So these are the four ecosystem processes which are very important in sustaining the earth. Now let us see something about distribution of biodiversity. Now ecosystems are distributed throughout the world. Ecosystems are contributed by biodiversity and they are sustained by biodiversity. They are distributed throughout the world. However, all ecosystems are not uniformly rich in biodiversity or species. Some ecosystems are very rich, some ecosystems are very poor. For example, terrestrial biodiversity is higher than that of the oceans. Although there are more, you know, volume in terms of volume, oceans are much more than the land, but biodiversity is higher on land than that of the oceans, something that has not been explained very well scientifically as to why this should happen. But this is the fact that the earth, the, dry, the land has got more species than the waters. Now, similarly, Tropical rainforests, you know, you are in Darwad. Darwad is close to the Western Ghats. Western Ghats has got tropical rainforests. Tropical rainforests are the richest ecosystem. They have the maximum biodiversity. World, well, you know, the biologists feel that half of all the species found on Earth can be found in the tropical rainforest. So what I'm trying to tell you is that some ecosystems are very rich in species. Some ecosystems like deserts and in the polar region are not so rich in species. So that kind of a variation exists throughout the world that makes the earth very, very asymmetrical. You know, different parts of the earth have different, you know, levels of biodiversity. Now, this is a term that people constantly use today. People talk about ecosystem services. So I just want to introduce you this term in this presentation. 
the ecosystem services basically mean the direct and indirect benefits provided by ecosystems to humans you know ecosystems provide benefits some are direct benefits some are indirect benefits for example food and medicine are direct benefits you know you just go into the forest and you collect food you go to the ocean and you collect fish you know you collect medicines from the wild and then you use it for you know traditional medicinal purposes and so on indirectly ecosystem serves us by pollination you know the insects found in the ecosystem they help in pollination without pollination you cannot have any crops and so on so pollination is a very important ecosystem service soil nourishment soil nourishment is very necessary for agriculture and all kinds of uh, human purposes so these are ecosystem services a few examples i have quoted these are provided by the ecosystem and the biodiversity that is present within now we shall see some of the threats to the ecosystem ecosystems are under constant threat and let us see what are the major threats to different ecosystems now first is the oceans so oceans are extensive but oceans are all suffering from overfishing we know that there are you know thousands and thousands of fishing vessels in the waters fishing constantly every day you know every day all through the year night and day fishermen go into the sea and they fish so this overfishing is a major problem which is disrupting you know ecosystem processes ecosystem structure and so on because fishes are removed in such large numbers not only the fishes we also have what we call bycatches many unwanted organisms which we do not use we also collect because the nets collect them and then they are just discarded and so on so overfishing is an important uh, threat to the ocean ecosystem pollution all the pollution that happens on earth ultimately reaches the sea whether it is chemicals or plastic or you know industrial waste ultimately they go into the sea so the seas are polluted climate change is also a major threat climate change can lead to sea level global warming and then changes in the currents you know surface temperature changes and so on and so forth so these are some of the major threats that are facing the ocean ecosystem now we have the islands islands are very fragile islands are fragile naturally because most of them are small except large islands like australia and madagascar most of the islands are small and they are fragile now islands are vulnerable to sea level rise people believe that many islands such as maldives lakshadweep you know which are close to india these are going to be submerged when the sea level rises you know people have predicted that in the next 100 years sea level by raise by you know few centimeters or a meter or half a meter or so so on so this will lead to sinking of these flat islands and the other islands will also be reduced in size and so on now islands are also being affected by human population most of the islands are now occupied by human beings as the population you know increases infrastructure you know they want to develop islands into tourist spots they want to have in you know, electricity on islands and so on there is enormous pressure on development on lakshadweep and the andaman islands in india and so on so throughout the world the island ecosystem is facing pressures from human development now tropical rainforest rainforests are being deforested at a very very rapid rate you know one of the biggest threats to tropical rainforests is the oil palm oil palm industry is expanding throughout the world and they are clearing you know kilometers of forest just to accommodate oil palm and other kinds of you know agriculture and development so deforestation is a major threat to tropical rainforest climate change is also a threat to tropical rainforest because people have predicted that you know the rainfall pattern can change and some of the forests which are enjoying good rainfall now may become dry and so on so these are some of the threats to tropical rainforest now grasslands are an important ecosystem although they are not given the due attention now the threats to grasslands because grasslands have already shrunk into fragments you know we have only small patches of grasslands everywhere and they are being grazed you know because human livestock population has increased enormously there is heavy pressure on grasslands from livestock grazing 
Now, invasive alien species, I will be talking to you about them later, are also a problem in grasslands. Green energy, although we think it is a sustainable mode of you know, generating energy, has been proved to be a threat to grasslands, particularly windmills. Windmills are being located in grasslands, and then many studies have shown that many species of birds, bats, and you know, small mammals are affected by this, and the grassland ecosystem is losing its character because of this. So this can be which which we have you know a, a, a program or a project which which has been you know conceived and developed to you know produce sustainable energy can also be dangerous. So we have to do a lot more thinking for in these lines before we implement some of these projects. Now, at least in India, the British classified the grasslands as wastelands because they could not extract any timber or anything from them. So they classified them as wastelands. That classification continues to remain. And that is why grasslands are being converted into all kinds of development projects so grasslands are some of the most threatened ecosystems throughout the world. Now, rivers are also threatened by pollution. All of us know how rivers flow within cities. They change color, they smell, and then, you know, they are completely polluted by, you know, water that comes out of factories and domestic sewage and so on. So pollution is a major threat to rivers. And this dams, you know, construction of dams. There are few rivers in India which are, you know, virgin without being blocked by dams. You know, several rivers, major rivers in this country. Many dams have been built and they have been completely blocked by the dams. And that, that changes the flow of water, that changes the movement of fish and other organisms. All kinds of changes take place. So major threats to rivers are pollution and construction of dams. Now, we have wetlands, various kinds of wetlands are found throughout the world. They are very important. We will talk about that later. Wetlands are also faced with pollution, pollution, invasive alien species, and encroachment. Wetlands are encroached by people for, you know, building houses, for agriculture and other purposes. They are also reclaimed, you know, many wetlands are reclaimed whenever they want a large stadium or a bus stand or some big you know, airport to be built wetlands are reclaimed. So wetlands are under great threat due to encroachment and reclamation. Now mountains, mountains are very vulnerable to climate change because most of these mountain tops are very cool and many of them are covered with ice and so on. So scientists feel that climate change will lead to warming and melting of this ice and that will change the character of the mountains. Tourism is a major pressure. You know, we know Himalayas. Himalayas is reeling under pressure of tourism. Tourism takes with it a lot of plastic and other waste, and then it leads to a huge human footprint. And these are problems which are, you know, threatening the survival of mountain ecosystems. Now, polar ecosystems, these are vulnerable to climate change. You know, the picture you see the polar bear, many people feel that the polar bear will not live for many more years. It is threatened with climate change and climate change leads to melting of glaciers. So the habitat of the polar bear shrinks and then, you know, polar bears are restricted to few chunks of, you know, glaciers and so on. So this is a major threat to the polar ecosystems. Now, having seen some of the major threats to the various ecosystems, I, these are only illustrative. I have not given you an exhaustive list. I have just given you a few highlights of what could be the problems faced by various ecosystems. We will now see how biodiversity sustains ecosystems. This is done in the form of interactions. So what are the major interactions sustained by biodiversity in keeping up the ecosystems? The first is the food, you know, the ecosystem. The thing that sustains the ecosystem is the availability and consumption of food. Now, the consumption of food, you know, organisms, they take food. And based on the type of food they take, organisms are classified as herbivorous animals, herbivores. Herbivores are basically those animals that eat plants, you know, not only mammals, but there are also other species, including insects and so on, which eat plants. These are all called herbivores. 
and then we have carnivores carnivores are basically flesh eating animals like lions and eagles wolves and tigers and so on and many other smaller animals like snakes and you know frogs these are also carnivores because they eat other living organisms and then there are omnivores omnivores are organisms like the crow pig and you know dog and so on which eat both you know vegetable matter as well as flesh so they have a mixed diet and they are called omnivores so every ecosystem the organisms that are found in the ecosystem can be classified as herbivores carnivores and omnivores now these create well established food webs i am sure you have seen food webs in your school textbooks biology textbooks these are basically linkages between different organisms in terms of food because one organism eats another organism then it gets eaten by another organism and so on so that is a food web and a food chain you know the lower organism higher organism high up to the you know this is what we talked about when we talked about the energy ecological processes which involves energy the food pyramid sometimes we call it the food chain and the connection between one to another through food is called the food chain now in ecosystems we also have predator prey interactions which is very important because predators keep the prey population under check for example you know tigers tigers keep the population of the wild boar wild pig under check you know in places like kerala because the tiger population has come down the population of the wild boar or the wild pig has you know increased enormously and the pigs in turn they come and raid the crops of human beings and it has become a problem so this is a problem of the ecosystem losing its balance its stability because predators are very important in maintaining the ecosystem so very well developed predator prey interactions are found within ecosystems then there are also parasites parasites are very important in maintaining the health of the organisms involved in the ecosystem so food is a very important component in sustaining ecosystems now competition it is very important in shaping the ecosystems there is competition now two kinds of competition are found one is the intra specific that is competition within the species you can see pictures here like two kangaroos fighting two dogs fighting over a deer you know two ant antelopes fighting that is a competition between within a species you know male female competition adult young competition and so on this is one form of competition the other form of competition is inter specific which is between species just like the picture you see in the right hand lower corner a lion fighting with a leopard you know two different species also fight so what i am trying to tell you is ecosystems every species competes with each other so there is a competition which creates a balance within the ecosystem this competition is for food for space for finding mates you know they will have to fight for finding a female they have to fight for fi finding food they have to fight for finding space and so on so competition is a very important component which characterizes ecosystems now there is a term that people often use you know carrying capacity whenever they talk about ecosystems carrying capacity can be defined in various ways but i am using you a very simple definition giving you a simple definition maximum number of individuals an ecosystem can support so every ecosystem has a carrying capacity which means maxing you know, for example if it is a big forest forest ecosystem how many elephants can the forest support how many tigers can the forest support that is how we assess the carrying capacity of an ecosystem now carrying capacity keeps the population of a species under control otherwise you know one species population will go on you know just like in urban areas the population of rats have gone up the population of dogs has gone up you know that is because the carrying capacity has been upset by human interventions so keeping population under control is a very important role played by carrying capacity of the ecosystem it also induces migration you know when a ecosystem reaches the carrying capacity species are no longer able to exist there so they migrate to newer areas so carrying capacity is a very important function that is seen in ecosystems now we will see how species help in this because all this time we talked about the various characteristics of ecosystem 
how ecosystems are sustained by biodiversity and so on. Now we are talking specifically species as a measure of biodiversity. So we will see how species, you know, help in the ecosystem sustenance. So first they create and sustain ecosystems. So without species, there cannot be any ecosystems. So they are the ones which create the ecosystems and they sustain ecosystems through their interactions. And we saw what these interactions are, competition, food, you know, all kinds of uh, activities which be undertaken by the species, which leads to the ecosystem sustenance. Now, there is something called species richness. This is basically the number of species that you would find in an ecosystem. Every ecosystem has a characteristic number of species, which we call the richness. And then we have abundance. So some species are abundant, some species are less abundant. So we call them common species and rare species. In every ecosystem, all species are not equally common or equally rare or equally abundant. Some species are more abundant, some species are less abundant and so on. So this abundance is a very characteristic feature of ecosystems, which is created by species. And that is how we classify species as common and rare. Now we will come to this term invasive alien species. These are species from other parts of the world introduced into new ecosystems that proliferate and cause adverse impacts on the ecosystem. So these are not native species, species which belong to other parts of the world. They are introduced into a new ecosystem where they multiply and cause very bad impacts on the ecosystem. So these are called invasive alien species. So we have got some common, there are many invasive alien species on earth, both plants as well as animals. But among plants, uh, these are the most uh, dangerous and these have been listed as the most dangerous plants on earth throughout the world. And they have, you know, occupied many countries. And I will just show you three examples. The first one is the Prosopis juliflora, which is a leguminous uh, tree. This was introduced from, you know, Mexico, basically as a firewood tree. For the poor people, they could use this tree as firewood and the government had introduced this. This was introduced not only in India, but Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, many other Asian countries. Now it is a major invasive species causing, you know, changes, damage to the ecosystem. Now the next one is also a, you know, tropical American species, Lantana camera. This was also introduced as an ornamental plant. You know, it was introduced as a garden plant from which it has escaped. And then it is found throughout the forest areas of India, causing major problems. It leads to fire, lots of economic damage, you know, crores and crores of rupees are being spent to con control this species. Similarly, a third species, water hyacinth, which is also from uh, abroad, that has been introduced into our wetlands. It was introduced as an ornamental species, which has run wild and it has got into our wetlands. And most of our wetlands have been damaged because of these species. So invasive alien species, they change the character of natural ecosystems and they are a major problem to our ecosystems. Now there are other species which keep together ecosystems and one of them is the keystone species. We call them a keystone species. Species that play a larger than life role in shaping ecosystems. Say there are some species which hold together the ecosystem. You know, if there may be 100 different species in an ecosystem, but all these species are held together by one species that is called the key keystone species. And there are many examples, but commonly used examples are fig trees, fig trees, including our banyan tree or people tree and so on. And termites, termites are sometimes considered as pets, pests, you know, in household and in agriculture, it is used, uh, considered a pest. But in natural ecosystems, it is a keystone species because it sustains the life of so many other different species in the ecosystem. Now, there are other species which we call ecosystem engineers, species that create novel ecological conditions and habitats for other species to coexist. So they not, do not just exist, but they create conditions for other species to coexist. Many examples can be said. Reef building corals are one of those. They keep on building and, you know, they create, you know, habitats for thousands of species of fish and other marine organisms. 
Now let us see what human being's role in an ecosystem is. You know, human beings, as I mentioned, are the modern human beings. We are not talking about the traditional human beings who live in forests like the Jarawas in the Andaman Islands and so on. But these are the modern human beings, what they exactly do. So they overexploit other species by hunting and by trapping and by collecting. You know, they exploit other species. You know, they have exploited them to the level of eliminating them completely. So over-exploitation of fish, over-exploitation of whales and, you know, so on and so forth. Mammals for their hair, tiger for its skin and so on and so forth. So they also transform the character of ecosystems by human actions. Humans, because of their actions, they use fire, they cut forests, you know, they lay roads and they fill, they reclaim wetlands and so on. So by their actions, they transform other ecosystems. They fragment and de degrade natural habitats. So natural habitats, which are once extensive, are fragmented into small pieces and they are degraded. They pollute the environment. You can see these pictures, how we pollute the environment with plastics and so on. And humans play a very important role in introducing alien species. So most of the alien species that have reached other parts of the world, including India, have reached through the human pathway. Humans have brought them directly or indirectly, but they have been introduced by human beings. Now let us see how species sustain ecosystems, because this is central to the talk that I'm delivering today. Species play a role in sustaining ecosystems. They not only create ecosystems, but they also sustain ecosystems. Now species contribute to the resilience of ecosystems. So species richness influences ecosystem resilience in a positive manner. You know, what does that mean is there is a positive correlation between species richness and ecosystem resilience. In general, ecosystems with more species are more resilient. That is why people generally are of the opinion that tropical ecosystems are more resilient than temperate and you know, polar ecosystems and so on. So resilience is contributed by species. So this is a very important aspect. Now, the structure and character of ecosystems are created by species. Species give ecosystems their structure and character. Structure means how many different species are there, you know, how many individuals of each species are there and so on, and that gives the character of the ecosystem. Some species are naturally more dominant in certain ecosystems. This I told you earlier, that not all species are equally abundant. Some are more common, we call them dominant species, and some are less common and so on. So that there is always this kind of a imbalance inside an ecosystem. Now, ecosystems can be classified based on the biological community. Biological community is nothing but a mixture of species. So based on the species that we find within an ecosystem, an ecosystem can be classified. So these are various contributions made by species in sustaining the ecosystems. Now, we talk about climate, we talk about climate change, global warming, etc. But there is something called microclimate. Species play a major role in creating microclimates that sustain ecosystems. You know, microclimates are climate locally, you know, locally within a small area. You know, this the organisms which are responsible for creating microclimates are trees, and then corals in seas, and then soil organisms like earthworms, insects, and some of these burrowing organisms. So they create locally a climate, you know, microclimate, which may be different from the overall climate of the region. So the microclimate is very important for the development and sustenance of ecosystems. Now, there is another term that we use, which are also part of the ecosystem species, bioindicators. These are actually living indicators. Bioindicators are living indicators. We can have various kinds of indicators, but living indicators. So changes in the abundance or behavior of certain species serve as early warning systems. You know, we talk about early warning systems about cyclones and, you know, other, you know, weather vagaries of the climate. We talk about early warning systems. So vagaries of the ecosystem are also warned by certain species. These are called bioindicators. They tell us about the health of the ecosystems. Such species are called bioindicators. And people continuously monitor these species to find out if the health of the ecosystem is all right. 
there are many examples. One of the common examples that we find in textbooks is the lichen. Lichen is a symbiotic organism with a combination between a fungus and a alga. So they they you know live on trees and rocks and so on. Many many of you who have gone to Himalayas or in the Western Ghats would have seen bio lichens. Lichens are excellent bioindicators of you know the atmospheric pollution and changes in the air. Now, species also sustain ecosystem process. So species play, and we saw the four ecosystem processes. You know, we talked about the water cycle, the energy cycle, the nutrient cycle, and the succession. All these are primarily controlled by species. Without species, none of the cycle would be complete. So they play a very important role. And without this role, ecosystems cannot be complete. And without this, the earth cannot be complete. So this is very important. Now, we will also come to this point because I saw in your program trees that empowering earth is one of the focus. So how can we empower the earth? Can we really empower the earth or are we just talking about it? So the zone of life in the earth is the biosphere. Biosphere is the complete zone of life. And as of now, we know earth is the only planet that has got a zone of life. Now, this biosphere is consists of numerous ecosystems, you know, numerous ecosystems. As I told you, I told you the major ones like, you know, tropical rainforest, polar ecosystems, grassland. But there are ever, several other smaller uni, units of ecosystems locally and, and, you know, you know, so they form the biosphere. The biosphere is made up of ecosystems. So ultimately, if we have to empower the earth, we have to save and sustain ecosystems. So this is the the central theme of my talk, my focus of my talk is basically that if we have to empower the earth, if we have to sustain the earth, we have to sustain ecosystems. It is not just enough if we have a few species here and few species there. We need to have ecosystems. They should interact, they should start functioning, they should govern the processes and so on. So this is very important and you should keep this in mind. Now, for this, what do we have to do? Because we are at a stage where Earth has lost a lot of its biodiversity and we are continuing to lose our biodiversity. We all know that. So to arrest this, what should we do? Now, we should protect species from endangerment and extinction. Endangerment is being threatened. You know, in India, for example, the rhinoceros is an endangered species. The elephant is an endangered species. Lion is an endangered species. Tiger is an endangered species and so on. And there are species that have gone extinct, which means they do not exist anymore. Extinction means it does not exist anymore. In India, the cheetah became extinct. Now, there are plans by the government to bring back the cheetah to India. But cheetah went extinct, you know, during the 20th century. So, to, we have to prevent this. We have to prevent species from becoming endangered or becoming extinct. We should have special efforts for the recovery of endangered species. The endangered species, we should continue to protect them and help them recover and their status should become stable. Now, we should do this by preventing habitat loss. The habitat should not be lost, habitat should not be fragmented and so on. This has to be managed very carefully. Now, one of the ways of doing this is restoration of ecosystems. I already talked to you about it earlier. You have to restore degraded habitats and ecosystem. Restoration is different from creating. Restoration is what already exists there. We repair it. You know, we help it come back. You know, we give it some treatment. We, you know, work with it and help it recover. You know, it is a system by which the ecosystem is able to come back. Now, this is better than creating artificial forests by planting trees because all over you know, the world, people are desperately planting trees. You know, they are just planting trees because they think that by planting trees, we can reduce global warming, you know, we can create pollution and so on, which is good. But then better still is actually restoring natural ecosystems. Natural ecosystems have to be restored. This is much better than artificially planting trees and creating forests. You know, for example, in India and other parts of the world, a lot of money is being wasted in planting trees without creating and sustaining ecosystems. You know, we create plantations of same species, plantations of exotic species. You know, today there is it is popular to have this Miyawaki forest and so on. All kinds of plantations are being done at a huge cost 
but they are not really creating and sustaining ecosystems. So this has to be borne in mind. So the difference between creating you know, forests and restoring forests have to be kept in mind. Now, what are the global efforts in you know, restoring the Earth's ecosystems? So world over, they have protected areas, you know, national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, and so on. Biosphere reserves, biosphere reserve program was started by the UNESCO and throughout the world, they have biosphere reserves for preserving the biodiversity and ecosystems. Ramsar sites are particularly focused on wetlands, wetlands of international importance. Then there are world heritage sites, you know, which are very important throughout the world. World is moving slowly towards sustainable agriculture. There is a lot of sustainable agriculture being talked about the less use of fertilizers, less use of pesticides, all kinds of, you know, more less use of machinery and more use of human power and so on, you know. So sustainable agriculture is a global effort. Organic farming, you know, many places people are turning to organic farming. Many coffee estates are becoming organic. Many vegetable gardens are becoming organic and so on. And finally, the Convention on Biological Diversity. This was a convention that came into pass in 1992 at a summit in Rio in Brazil. You know, so this uh, convention is being, you know, ratified by all the countries of the world. So this convention is a kind of a law which kind of protects biodiversity throughout the earth, biodiversity, ecosystem, species, genes, everything. So Convention of Biodiversity, if you actually log into the web and see, you will get a better idea. India is also a signatory to this convention. Now, what does India do? India is also very active. India has done a lot of, you know, made a lot of efforts in conserving its biodiversity. So in India, we have 18 biosphere reserves, 104 national parks, 551 wildlife sanctuaries, 88 conservation reserves, 127 community reserves. These are all legally protected areas, you know, maintained by the government. And then Ramsar sites, you know, wetlands. 49 wetlands in India have been declared as Ramsar sites. And World Heritage Sites, you know, important areas of the Western Ghats and then some parts of Assam, Kasiranga and so on. They have been designated as World Heritage Sites and they are being conserved. Now, this gives you an idea of how our protect, I, show, I showed you national parks and wildlife sanctuaries in India, how these are distributed throughout the country. Very impressive. It's very wide distribution. Almost all parts of the country have has been have been covered with protected areas. But on, you know, in the fact is that when you actually take in terms of area, because, you know, some small protected areas, big protected areas and so on. In terms of area, all these cover less than 5% of India, India's land area. Less than 5% of India's land area is actually covered by protected areas, which means 95% of India are still exposed to all kinds of, you know, development, fragmentations, you know, invasive species. So we have to do more than that. This is not enough. This, If we really have to sustain the earth, sustain India, sustain India's ecosystems, we really have to do a lot more than this. We have to bring more systems under protected, you know, although they are not legally protected. For example, your students of IIT, Darwad, your campus, the biodiversity of the campus, the forest, the trees, the plants, they have to be protected. You know, wherever they exist, we should prevent species from going extinct. We have to protect them in small ways, in small ways, medium ways, and then large ways, and so on. All system cannot be handled by the government, but the people should also work together. And then we should increase the protection given to our species. Only then ecosystems will remain intact. Only when ecosystems remain intact, the earth can sustain itself. So this is my message to you. Basically, I hope you have got it and you understood it thank you for giving me this opportunity and uh, i am sure you like the talk and you learned something out of it thank you very much uh, thank you sir uh, now we can take a question and answers uh, uh, from the question answer box uh, sir you uh, said about uh, what is the uh, nutrient cycle you said about few cycles what is the nutrient cycle yes. Uh, will imbalance cycle is uh, yes, if completed. Uh, will imbalance yes, in the energy cycle hamper the nutrient cycle? 
Yes, yes, all these are connected because nutrient cycle is how the nutrients in the soil, nutrients in the atmosphere like nitrogen and you know carbon, etc., pass through the living organisms and back to the soil, back to the atmosphere, back to water, and so on. That is basically aided by animals and plants because they take this from the soil and then they die, they come back to the soil, and then they are taken to the atmosphere in the form of gases and so on. So this is actually also connected to the the energy because the energy is actually the food consumption so when animals consume the food they also take the nutrients inside there so they talk about atrophy usually when they when an animal consumes another animal or it consumes another plant 10 percent of the energy can go waste you know this is called entropy in ecology so that is why you have this pyramid which is you know conical and shape becoming narrower towards the top you know as the energy flows from the bottom to the top there is a lot of wastage that is why we find that lower organisms are more numerous predators are less numerous you know this is one of the theories which explain why we have fewer number of tigers when compared to you know a wild pig or you know wild hare and rats and so on because the lower organisms are more numerous because the energy is much more stored in them. As it goes up and comes into the tiger, it becomes less and then tiger population comes down. So, of course, the energy cycle and the nutrient cycle are connected to one another. And this is certainly connected to the water cycle and so on. So, all these are interconnected, but ecologists have identified these four distinct cycles which sustain the earth. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so the viruses such as corona will disturb the food ecosystem sometimes. Uh, it is because of imbalance created by the human interventions in the natural habitat. Yeah, it is possible that it could in interfere with the food because of the disease caused in organisms and so on. But basically, coronavirus is something which was known in animals for uh, many years before we knew it in 19, 2019. Coronavirus was always known in captive pet dogs and so on. So coronavirus was known. It is only recently that it jumped from you know other animals to human beings. Now people feel, some people at least feel that this is because of the ecosystem degradation and the closer proximity to humans and animals and the more interaction with human and animals, particularly people, you know, consuming animals as food and so on. So this is a, there is a direct link between that and that you know more viruses that cause diseases could upset the food webs and food and food cycles yeah it does happen yes thank you sir uh, so what is your opinion about the role of primary school teachers in educating primary school students about our environment this is very important because education is very, very important and at all levels it should be done not just primary schools even at the levels of government officers and you know all administrators politicians everybody should be you know educated primary school is the best beginning place you know primary school is where you really put into the minds of children the importance of nature the environment because many schools they have environmental studies as part of their science program you know so they have evs they call it evs so in primary school they talk about plants and animals food webs and food chain and so on so it is very important for teachers to dedicate themselves to train the primary school children on the basics in simple terms. You know, they should understand it in simple terms, simple illustrations, simple examples, simple outings, you know, take them out to the field and talk to them about butterflies and butterflies and plants and so on. So this is very important, the very idea of the ecosystem, because many people don't understand this word ecosystem because it is used loosely in so many other contexts. You know, people talk about a business ecosystem. People talk about an education ecosystem. That is very different from the biological ecosystem. Biological ecosystem is characterized by species and their interactions. You know, so that has to be, you know, driven into the heads of small children that they will understand that every species is valuable. You know, we, even inside the house, if there is a rat or something you don't kill it you catch it and you let it out if there is a cockroach you catch it and let it out and so on all life is valuable all life has to be preserved that idea has to be driven into the children by the primary school teachers uh, thank you sir uh, there is another question about how to control the spreading of invasive tree species like prosopis juliflora 
commonly found in the local territory yeah it is very difficult and very challenging you know government is spending forest department is spending crores and crores of rupees in actually eliminating these species because they are very well adapted they have developed very good associations with the local species local animals which transfer their seeds and so on and prosapis juliflora particularly if you cut the tree it does not die it is, uh, starts sprouting from the roots and so on so you have to completely uproot it you have to remove all the seeds from the soil because they are legumes they have pods you have to remove the pods from the soil you have to put in a lot of effort now in the tamil nadu state uh, from where i am the government the high court has issued an order saying that the state should be made free of all these invasive species particularly the prosapis and government is really struggling because it's such a challenging task and once they have invaded it's very difficult to remove them same with lantana lantana or forests are all suffering because of lantana wildlife is suffering it leads to fire and you know, leads to other problems you know leads to the spread of parasites and so on same way the aquatic environment the water hyacinth so we need to really work hard to prevent them from spreading further you know we should prevent them from spreading further we should understand their biology and then we should deal with them appropriately there are lots of efforts in this country but it will take many more years before we say we have brought them under check you know it's a challenging task it's a very challenging task sure sir so a uh, couple of questions now so what is the effect of soil erosion can you explain its big uh, its effect in a big picture so yeah soil erosion can lead to loss of nutrients because the erosion is always on the top soil you know the erosion takes place whether it is wind erosion or water erosion it always occurs on the top soil and the soil nutrients are always restricted to the top layer you know the top top 1 meter or so is where the nutrients lie below that you know it is less nutrient and so on so the soil erosion leads to lack of loss of nourishment i talked to you about soil nourishment soil nourishment will lead to creating barren lands you know no plants can grow there no organisms can actually live there barren lands and then that in turn affects the diversity because the grasses don't grow you know food plants for animals don't grow insects don't grow soil organisms don't grow so eventually locally this will create a problem and it once this becomes widespread it affects large areas large areas can become barren there are several examples shown of tropical rainforests which have been cleared which become completely barren because of the high rainfall and the soil erosion you know closer to darwad you would have seen this lateritic rocks you know western ghats we know which are with the exposed lateritic rocks these are all problems of soil erosion because these areas are high rainfall areas particularly high rainfall the rainwater washes away the soil where there are no plants and so on so eventually it leads to serious imbalances in the ecosystem leading to what we call barrenness barrenness so this is a large large scale problem it has to be dealt with very carefully uh, thank you sir uh, this is again a question regarding you know is uh, invasive alien species yes uh, sir you were talking about this invasive alien species and how they yes. damage the ecosystem Yeah, uh, yeah but is it right to eliminate one species because it is not meant to be there in the first place can't yeah, the alien yeah. species coexist with other species no it has happened it is it has happened for example the lantana camera has coexisted with other species but what they do is in terms of number in terms of their what we call biomass technically in terms of biomass they exceed all other species so they don't allow other species to grow for example lantana doesn't allow other species to germinate under it prosapis doesn't allow grass to grow under it so they actually prevent the other species from surviving thereby they destroy the natural and native species this is why we say we should remove them because they if they also mingle with our native species and they grow which is which is the case with some fishes in some of our wetlands we have invasive species they have very well you know mingled with the community and you know th- there is a coexistence which is possible but in land you know these plants are not allowing coexistence they completely cover for example water hyacinth it completely covers the surface of water allowing the light you know preventing the light from penetrating into water if the light does not penetrate into water the productivity of the water will come down and then you know the oxygen levels come down 
So the type of fishes that live there will change. All kinds of changes are caused. So these major impacts are what caused by the invasive species. That is why we say that the invasive species should be removed. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I have a question regarding this micro uh, ecosystems that you said, and then yes, uh, protecting yes. micro ecosystems is important yes. in yes. order to look at the you know empowering the earth and yes. so uh, so how micro in the sense like uh, uh, one should do how we define these micro ecosystems like micro it's based basically scale uh, you know for example I'll talk to you about you you have many trees on your your uh, Darwad University, your IIT campus, okay? So yes. now these trees, many of these trees are old trees, and these trees have got holes on their branches. You know, you would have seen holes in the branches and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, within this hole, you find a micro, micro environment. It's, it's cooler than outside, and many birds use this for nesting. You know, many other animals like squirrels, etc., live inside them and so on. So this is a small scale. At a smaller scale, you may take a tree, and the tree holes. You know, tree holes are a very important component in the micro environment and they cause the micro ecosystem where birds breed because they are very important. We have a category of birds called hole nesting birds. There are many species of hole nesting birds like barbets, hornbills, parakeets, minas, and so on. They all live inside holes. They breed there, they lay their eggs there, and they are able to survive. They cannot survive without holes. You know, many species of hole nesting birds have disappeared from our forest because the forests do not provide sufficient holes, because these forests are artificially created, they are same age, there are no old trees and so on. So micro ecosystems, they start from a small scale of a single tree. You know, people have, biologists in South America have estimated that a single tree can have 30 to 40 different species of ants. You know, ants are very important organisms on earth. So 30 to 40 different species of ants can be found on a single tree. Now that is a micro ecosystem. So like that, starting from a single tree to a small habitat, you know, a pond and so on, it can range, you know, in sizes. And then you can find a whole lot of these things. And these have to be integrated, particularly if you, if you, if you had read the management plan that we had prepared for the Darwad IIT. You know, it talks about this, although it may not have used this word micro ecosystem. You know, campus management should look into all the existing natural habitats and protect them so that the overall biodiversity of the campus is sustained. You know, so this is basically paying attention to the micro ecosystems. I hope I made it clear to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, we come to the end of this question and session, sir. Yes. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, 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 Professor Enara, you want to mention anything? Sir? No, I, uh, we, I must, I have to only say that uh, we are enlightened and uh, it has been a very good learning experience. I just wanted to comment that, yes, the ecological management plan does uh, mention about micro ecosystem and uh, we have plans and we have, uh, fortunately, we have got a very good response from the forest department as well. Uh, they have promised us to give us uh, such type of species and plants, which are already semi-grown. Uh, okay. to be planted inside the campus, which would okay. cover micro ecosystems as well. So okay. thank you very much. And it was very okay. enlightening and very, very educative uh, lecture, which we heard. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we would like to thank uh, our guest speaker for the trees talk 10, uh, Dr. RJ Ranjit Daniels, for his invaluable time. We also thank the audience for their questions and an interactive discussion. Uh, to strengthen the inclusive technological in innovation ecosystem in the areas of renewable energy, energy production, usage, improvements in energy efficiencies, the Global Center of uh, Excellence in Affordable and Clean Energy, GCOE ACE at IIT Darwad, with Selco Foundation, are looking for uh, regulated problem statements and innovative solutions through an innovation challenge called as Catalyze Tech. The problem statements uh, may be from sectors such as livelihood, agriculture, agricultural industries, resilient macro businesses, built environment, health, education, etc. So you can contact us uh, to get the uh, form for submission for uh, this Catalyze Tech. And thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Daniels, again. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you thank you dr biraj thank you thank you thank Enjoy you yeah yeah